Here. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, a practical guide to implementing effective BI governance, sponsored today by Metric Insights. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And again, just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may change it to send to all attendees as well to chat with each other. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Mike Smitherman and and Marius Moscovici. Mike is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Metric Insights and has over 15 years of product and marketing experience in the business intelligence industry. He helped bring analytic products to market with senior roles at Seagate Software, AIM Technology, Tea Leaf, Xero, and Good Data. Marius has over 20 years of experience in analytics and data warehousing. Marius is the CEO of Metric Insights, the leading provider of BI portal that helps organizations organize their BI environments and ensure users are getting the actionable data they need. And with that, I will give the floor to Marius to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, really great to be here. And uh, before we start, we're going to just get, getting a level setting here. We're going to talk about practical guide to BI governance. Uh, it'd be good to really understand what uh, BI governance is about. So I want to make sure that we were clear on level set that when we talk about BI governance and analytics governance, uh, it is often the case that uh, people just think about a data governance when they think about governance. And that's that can be a very big mistake because in reality, only you know a small percentage of your user community is consuming the, your data directly. You know, writing SQL, maybe your data scientists, maybe your BI analysts are writing SQL against the database or using Python or going at it directly. But but the vast majority of the of the constituents in your organization are going after data using analytics, whether that be a BI tool that's been implemented. Uh, with a solution or whether that be uh, multiple tools uh, where it's been put, put together and wrapped into Excel, deployed via Python, uh, whatever might be the um, uh, whatever might be the, the solution that you, that you devise. So when you think about governance, it's very important to think about both pieces of these puzzles and come up with a solution that addresses both data as well as the front end analytics that users are consuming. So with that said, um, I want to kind of set the stage by, by, you know, with something that Gartner has, has uh, commented on. And they've said that through 2022, only 20% of organizations investing in information governance will succeed in scaling their initiatives across the enterprise. Now think about that for a moment. That means that 80% of the governance initiatives that are going to be attempted throughout this next year are going to fail, right? And that's a staggering failure rate. And that I think, you know, is sort of shocking in many ways. And yet, I don't think for many of us on these calls, that's a big surprise because scaling governance initiatives beyond a small department, getting it to a point where it really is adopted at enterprise scale and doing it effectively where you're generating ROI for your effort is, is actually a very complex task. And why is that? Well, it's because there are these three gears that have to turn together in unison in order to make it work. You've got to have the right people in the right roles with the right responsibilities. They have to be given a process that really works within your governance framework. And then you have to have technology that, 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 that meshes with the people and with the process to enable that, from, that process to be executed effectively. If any one of these gears does not turn or is not the right size or doesn't fit with the rest, then the whole thing is just not going to work. The machine will not work and the governance initiative will fail. So let's talk a little bit about what each of these gears is about and what involves success in these areas. So first let's talk about roles and responsibilities. So 
typically what we've seen is that there are three kind of primary roles that are involved here. There's the business, and let's imagine this, call this role the business owner. And these are the folks that are responsible for defining the rules that govern how the data should be interpreted. You know, what defines sales? What defines revenue? What defines churn? All the main things that are going to be measured and shown in a particular report or dashboard or data science visualization have to have somebody at some point defining what that, what that means. And, and usually the business has to come up with that consistent definition. So the business owner isn't it was responsible for that scope of government. Then you have the BI analyst. And, and essentially the BI analyst is, is responsible for taking that uh, information. You know, here I'm gonna be measuring sales. Uh, I'm gonna build a dashboard that, that's built on top of sales. Here's how sales is defined. I, we've gotten that, that baseline defined for me. Now I'm responsible for both putting together the business logic so that these reports or dashboards are created with a consistent definition for that, those particular measures. So they're the implementers of the analytics. And then finally, in some cases, you've got the data stewards. These can be uh, data governance team members. They could sometimes be individuals that are responsible for data engineers that might be doing pipelining, but there are, there are fundamental responsibilities to make sure that the data has arrived in the right place with the right definition, that the analytics that are being used are being sourced from the right place so that information is consistent and of a high quality. Right, so these are broadly the roles. And of course, you know, an individual may fit uh, multiple roles. It can be distributed across the entire organization. There can be a lot of complexity around this. But broadly speaking, these tend to be the three large uh, swaths of roles. To look at this as an example, in a practical sense, let's imagine that you have a sales operations use case. So uh, imagine you have a dashboard that's measuring the sales rep attainment against goal in an enterprise. Uh, so each sales rep comes in and says, okay, here's how I'm doing uh, relative to my target. Here's what my commission is going to be by the end of the quarter if I continue doing this. Right? In this example, uh, a, the, the business role, the business uh, analyst would be the business rule that would be responsible for defining the business rules. They would be defining, you know, what does attainment mean? Uh, what are the territory alignments? Uh, how do we measure the progress of this particular sales rep against goal and how do we measure their compensation? So they would come up with those rules uh, that, that would be used as the fundamental underpinning of this visualization. Then the, the analyst who might be, let's say, a sales ops report developer, that person would come in and they'd say, okay, let me build a dashboard and make sure that this dashboard, uh, perhaps in Tableau or Power BI, whatever tool they selected, that, that this dashboard uses these rules that have been agreed upon and visualizes everything correctly based on that. And then finally, from a data, data validation perspective, the, you know, perhaps a, a Salesforce data pipelining engineer or ETL engineer, that person is responsible for making sure that, well, did we get the data from the right place in Salesforce? Is there the right transformation logic to land the data from Salesforce into our, um, into our data warehouse? Did we pull the targets from the right place in the financial system? Is that all being integrated? Uh, and then, you know, have, is that information all available to the, to the business analyst to make sure they're using the data correctly. So you can see how kind of these three roles work together around the governance of both the data and the visualization for this particular analytic. So let's talk about process next. And here there's just a, this very common issue that, that, that happens all the time. We see this in our, with, our, with, with customers um, day in and day out. And that one of the big reasons that governance initiatives fail is that people try to do this one size fits all approach. So, you know, in, invariably uh, in an enterprise, nobody really wants to do governance. It's one of these things that you just have to do in order to be effective. Uh, but, you know, no, none of the folks in the organization, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I really want to add documentation and classification and, and, and go through process. You know, people want to just go out there and build reports and, and solve problems. And so it's one of these things that then, you know, what naturally happens is that one, one of two things takes place. Either governance is instituted because it is something that's required, the regulatory requirements, or it's clearly, you know, there's such a mess in the BI infrastructure that you've got to clean it up because your users are screaming because they don't know where to find things. Um, so, you know, you've got that driving it, um, or, uh, you know, in which, in which case you, you tend to basically go, go where your build this process is very heavy and cumbersome and can be very difficult to execute, or you come up with something super lightweight because, you know, you think, well, I, I, people are not really going to follow this process if it's, if it's too heavy. 
And so, you know, we're going to just go with something really, really light and, and people and maybe more of a guideline based perspective and, and, and make it very easy for people to follow. And, and this, these, you know, if you go with either of those extremes, it doesn't work for many of the assets that you have because some things require more governance, some things require less governance. And the worst of all cases, if you just meet in the middle and say, well, let's, let's just make it kind of halfway in between these two. And then you've essentially, uh, you, you, you've, you fit no one. And you, end, you essentially, the, the analogy I like to use is it's as if you opened up a clothing store uh, that sells suits and you sell everybody walking in exactly the same size, which represents the average size of what people wear, right? Your, your likelihood of actually having some, something fit is very, very low. And that's you know, intuitively obvious if you think about suits. And yet we do this kind of thing all the time with governance and, and it leads to failure consistently. So don't do that. Don't think of a one size fits all. So what do you do instead? Well, we suggest basically this classification mechanism where you build a, a content classification grid. So you look at the asset that you're, that you're governing and you then, you know, make sure that it fits correctly within this grid. And then based on that fit, then you assign the right level of governance to it. So this grid is broken up into two axes. On the one axis, you look at audience size. So is this visualization something that's being consumed by a small number of individuals? Is it maybe a departmental type solution? Or is it something that's going to go to a very large group of people? Maybe it's enterprise-wide consumption or very large departments. On the other axis, you look at business impact. Is this analytic that's being governed? Is it something that is gonna, if something goes wrong, if the data is incorrect, if the data is misinterpreted or used incorrectly, what is gonna be the impact of that? Is it gonna have a massive impact on the business? You know, is this the kind of thing that's going out to your board of directors and your executives are making key strategic decisions from? Is it gonna have sort of a medium level impact? Well, yes, it's important, but you know, not the end of the world. Or is it something where, you know, yes, this is important to the person using it, but they might have two or three other things at their disposal to tell them that something's going wrong and therefore it's really low business impact if there's an issue. And every analytic that you can think of, every report or dashboard can be placed in one of these nine quadrants. Let's look at some examples. So let's, and, and then based on that, excuse me, based on that, you then are going to identify who is going to be responsible for the govern, governance process. Right? So something with low impact and has a small audience, then probably the appropriate governance process for that is just for the BI analyst to be responsible for the entire governance, making sure everything has high quality, making sure the data is good, the analytic uses the right logic and so on and so forth. On the other hand, something that has medium business impact, maybe departmental solution with a, uh, with a, a, a medium audience size that, that you know, has, it has some real impact, uh, maybe a sales report that, that could be uh, problematic if it provides the wrong information, that you might want to involve the business owner in that because they want to have that le extra level of validation to make sure that this is consistent with the latest business rules that have been defined. Um, and, and you, you know, you don't want to rely on just the BI analyst to do it because, you know, people make mistakes and you want to have a little bit more assurance. At the other extreme, if you've got something with a large audience, maybe a high level of impact, now you really want to surround this, this with, a, with a process that involves multiple parties. It's a three-party um, governance process where the BI analyst makes sure the reporting is correct, the business owner makes sure all the logic reflects the latest business logic, and the data steward makes sure the data has all been sourced from the right place. And following the same kind of approach, right, you can imagine filling in the grid based on what's appropriate in your business for all these different other, other scenarios. And now you have a mapping that says, who should be involved in each step of the governance process uh, if, you know, for this particular um, asset that you're working with. So these assets require three-party governance, this assets require one, these assets require two. And that's the starting point by which you can, uh, you can ensure that you're tailoring the governance process to the right uh, audience, right? And so to, again, with the effort of making it practical, let's look at some examples. So imagine for a moment that you have a network performance report. So this is something that a uh, network engineer is using to see if their the system network is overloaded. Right? So that example, 
clearly is going to be a, a small business impact and a small audience. Only a, a handful of engineers are using it. And you know, if the report is not showing them the right number, but the network is performing poorly, they're probably going to know because they're going to be people complaining about it. So, so yes, you want to make sure it's right, but the, the impact of getting it wrong is not tremendous. Um, in, in, this, in this example, um, you know, that would fall into that category. And then, and then, uh, and then you would go from there. And, and that, there's another grid here on the right, which I'll talk about in a moment, where you can then determine where the decertificate, the, the, uh, the process that would be followed to recertify an, an element um, would apply as well. So we'll, we'll hold off and I'll discuss that in a moment. Another example is the uh, sales quota attainment report. So here for a moment, let's imagine that you've got something that the example I gave you before, where there is a sales report and it's being used by your uh, sales team to be able to determine how they're performing. Uh, so that goes has medium business impact because you know uh, clearly communicating the right performance versus to target to a sales rep is important. You don't want inaccuracies in that. Um, and it has a medium audience size. It's going to the entire sales team. And again, in here, you would have two different uh, individuals involved. You want the business analyst and you'd want the, uh, the, the, um, the, the um, both that business analyst and the business person involved in this. And then you would also want to have a, a process by which the, maybe this, this kind of content goes through a decertification process, whereby at the, uh, you know, at, at the end of every quarter, uh, as the new territory alignments come into place, that content gets decertified and then gets recertified once it's been revalidated by the business with the, with the territory alignments and everything have not changed. And then a final example might be a, a fiscal monthly fiscal report. So this is uh, perhaps a report that goes out to uh, your the board of directors and your executives on the performance of your business. Uh, it's incredibly high impact, right? If you get those numbers wrong, it, it maybe there's some Sarbanes-Oxley impl implications. Uh, maybe there's some uh, fiduciary responsibility issues and liability involved in that. So in this case, even though it's a small audience, uh, closely held data, uh, it, it has very high business impact. And this is the kind of thing that would require three-party certification, lots of people involved, lots of processes involved around this. And also would be something that probably would be subject to some kind of decertification process that would occur on some kind of a calendar basis. So at the end of the month, uh, you need to reclose the books to validate the financial for the, for the prior month during the period of time when the books are being closed, this reporting will be decertified. And then once the finance team has checked all the boxes and said, yes, these numbers are correct, it would be recertified and then and the people consuming it would know that it, that it's good so that's an example of the of different items let's talk for a moment about process as itself so you know identifying among these different individuals that are involved uh, you you there also, there's also different things that you're going to want to do with a particular analytic so for example uh, you might want to make sure that the data quality alerts are in place so whatever it is that you've created how do you know that the data is good how do you know that the that, that specifically how do you know the data is good today? Maybe the data was loaded correctly last month, but in this month's data it's not. So you know what kind of checks need to be in place for that? Um, second step in the governance process might be to say, well, what kind of data classification fields do I need to add to this content? You know, do I need to flag this as containing PII data or identify that this is internal or sensitive or has to be handled in a special way? Right. So that's a that's a governance layer that, that should be added to any visualization. You might want to add documentation, things like release notes, uh, the ability to identify what key terms mean within the, the, uh, the, the report and or how, how that particular report has changed over time so that somebody consuming it is aware of the fact that, hey, we actually changed the business rule here and the sales this reflects the sales territory alignment that just took effect. So if your numbers look different, that's why, right? Um, you might want to tag this with glossary terms so that you, somebody looking at that sales report, they understand, well, what, what, what counts as sales? Does this do, do third party sales that is channel sales included in this or just the sales that I'm selling directly? Uh, what exceptions are there to, to how this works? So all that kind of terminology you might want to associate with this. And then there's the whole certification process. So ultimately, you know, saying, being able to say, well, once I've validated that everything is right, the definitions are right, the source is right. Okay, now we know we can actually say this was certified um and 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 identify that who certified it and 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 when it was certified um and then aligning it back to the process that we talked about in the roles depending upon whether it's a one party a two party or a three party certification process different people will be doing 
these different steps. So a BI analyst may be performing all these steps for a single party certification model, a two party model where the business owner is involved. Maybe the analyst is just doing the tracking of data quality alerts and adding the data classification and adding the documentation. But the business owner is going in and tagging to the, to the right glossary terms. They're responsible for really saying, yes, I'm certifying that this is measuring sales in the way that we on the sales ops team have designated as the right way to do it. Um, as well as to finally give it that certification stamp of approval to say, yes, uh, everyone in the business can trust this. I verified that, th that this is correct. And then in a three-party certification model where the data steward's involved, then perhaps the data steward is responsible for saying, Yes, those quality alerts are in place. You can trust the data. Yes, the right data classification has been assigned to this. And then the BI analyst is simply responsible for making sure that, that the report accurately brings in the data and that the right rules are applied there with the, the, with the uh, uh, business owner having final responsibility around glossary terms and, and content certification. So you can see, I mean, this is an example, but you can see how you could easily craft this in your organization based on your data, your content, the steps that you wanna follow in your certification so that it's not a one size fits all. So it's, a, so it's, a, it's a something that where the asset is first classified, it goes into the right model where the how many parties are involved in the certification process. And then the right individuals are then responsible for the right steps to make sure that certification and publishing of this content is really meaningful and that the right data gets pushed up. Um, you saw this little grid on my last, on my previous slide. I want to kind of speak to for a moment. When you think about certification and publishing a content that's certified, it's very important to understand that certification is not a one and done phenomenon, right? So you cannot be successful if all you do is certify content and forget about it because invariably over time, even content, the content that is, that is absolutely correct today, you know, six months, nine months, a year, year and a half from now, it might no longer be correct. There might be business rules that needs to be revisited. So there needs to be a process whereby you're either automatically decertifying content, like the examples I gave you before with the financials, where it just gets decertified at the end of every month because it has to undergo a certification process, or, or the sales realignment where the territories get realigned once a year or once a quarter, or if it's something that has to be reviewed for recertification. So uh, many other reports might be, well, they're probably still good, but somebody should check them every six months, every year, every 12 months, every 18 months, whatever the right interval is to determine that they're, that they're correct. So for every asset you need to say, does, is the subject automatic decertification or should, be, should it be reviewed uh, on, a regular, uh, on a regular basis? And then is it, should it be, should this process undergo based on a calendar or should it happen based on an elapsed time? You know, 12 months after it was published, a year, uh, a year and a half after it was published, whatever is relevant from there. And then based on that, you classify the content and then you put it into the appropriate workflow such, to, such that this recertification or certification review process occurs <laughs> as needed to make sure that it's still accurate. And, that, and this gives your users a comfort level that when they know some, they've seen something certified, they know when it was last certified, perhaps when it was last reviewed, and they know that they can really trust the analytics. The other key, key point here is that we also want to recognize that when a con when content has been certified, when an asset's been certified, that if that asset changes, then you need to reevaluate that certification. Now, you might have different kinds of changes. There's high risk and low risk changes, and those should probably be treated differently. So an example of a high risk change would be maybe you, the logic in the underlying uh, tables that are being used for particular visualization has been modified. Um, in that example, I've changed the logic, the SQL statements changed. Well, that might be cause for automatically decertifying the content and then revisiting it because maybe there's something clearly that's changed the metric definition. A low risk change might be somebody just changing a description or, um, or, or something of that nature. And in that example, then maybe you all you wanna do is review this item to be to say, hey, there's been some change in here. It doesn't look like a high impact change, but let's go ahead and put this into a pipeline where somebody can review that content for potential for potential uh, decertification. And so keep it certified, but make sure that it's that the change has been noticed by and, and it, that somebody's reviewed it and, and indicated yes, it's okay. So that has to be a part of the of a puzzle, along with automated time based and 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 or event based uh, review for content to be continuously certified. So we've talked about the 
people, and we talked about process. The third really important gear here is technology, right? What good is a great process and people that are willing to engage in it if at the end of the day, it's onerous, if there isn't the right, right mechanism in place to make it easy? You know, the reality is no matter what, people will want to spend as little time as possible on governance. So you need to have a technological underpinning, the tools in place to facilitate effective governance in a way that is very low touch, that requires very little effort from users, and that provides really a lot of transparency and visibility around the whole process. And there are three parts to this solution, and we'll, we'll kind of dig into details in a moment. Okay. The first part is there has to be a place, a portal, a place where all of the governed content can be assembled. So if you think about this governance problem and you consider the fact that if you're trying to do the governance, if you have three or four different BI tools and some data, some, some, and you have reports that people are consuming in Excel and PDF and uh, lots of different tools out there, right? If you have that situation, if you attempt to instantiate governance across each of those silos independently, that is just a, an effort that's doomed for failure. You're never going to even get out of the starting gate on that undertaking. So, so you have to have a way to pull all that content into a governance space, a single portal, a single access point where people can get to the content as well as the governed information around that content, the certification, the tagging, and so forth, um, in, a co in a coherent and consistent fashion. So that's a, that's a key pillar of the technological solu solution. A second piece of the puzzle is the workflows. So we talked about the fact that there's going to not going to be a one size fits all, that that doesn't work, which means that for the process of classifying content, publishing, certifying, assuming things are tagged to the right things, that all has to be governed through a workflow and there has to be some technology to support that workflow effectively so that it is not cumbersome or onerous for the people doing it. And so that there's transparency around where things move as they go through, the, through that workflow. And then finally, there has to be a compliance and reporting aspect to this. So if you have the portal, if you've got the workflows, but if you can't tell how, a measure how you're doing, both from a perspective of knowing are you adhering to the governance policies? Are things being certified? Are there things that have gone through the certification process six months ago, but have not been reviewed and recertified? Um, you know, all, all those things. Are, so basically the checks and balances to ensure that things get escalated and that, and that people are aware of the things that they need to take action on, as well as the measurement of the effectiveness of the process. You're doing this governance, not just to ensure security, but to boost engagement, to increase data literacy, to, to do a lot of things to improve things in your enterprise. So how do you know whether that's happening? You need to make sure you have the tools in place that measure those things so that you then can say definitively that yes, this process is working, or if it's not working, here, let me go make some adjustments. So with that, I'm going to hand you off to Mike, who's going to show you some actual examples of how the portal workflows and compliance can work together to, uh, to provide so, uh, uh, the technical support uh, to the governance effort. Yeah, thanks, Marius. So I'm just going to take a second here and switch across to our uh, demo environment. Just give me one second. Resume sharing here. Uh, so this way, this is coming up. Um, so yeah, as Marius said, I'm going to uh, take us through sort of how Metric Insights um, implements some of these things, and um, and we'll touch on the three areas that that Marius spoke about. So this this concept of you know having a centralized portal for uh, for accessing and governing governing content, and then talking through the the workflow pieces that enable you to um, publish content in a governed way through those different you know, stakeholders and resources that, that we spoke about. Um, and so the first piece I'm going to look at um, essentially from the perspective a little bit of sort of the, the end user and what it means to have access to governed content so that I can better um, and better be able to understand the context behind the, the assets that I have access to. Um, let's just try and refresh this here. Okay. Um, so what you're looking at here is the is the metric insights portal, but essentially think of this as a piece of technology where as an end user, when I come in, 
um, the, the complexities of understanding where reports and dashboards exist and what technologies um, they exist in, understanding what I can trust is kind of um, masks for me and I can come in and access content in one place. So what you're looking at here is sort of a catalog view of content where there's reports and dashboards coming in from multiple tools and essentially I have access to content in one place. And so you'll see I've got stuff coming from Tableau, Power BI, I've got spreadsheets and PDF documents all accessible to me and really I don't even have to understand where they are coming from. And um, if I click on a particular asset, um, I, I get a preview of, of what that content is. And, and as we'll see, because this content has been through a governance process like Marius described, when I preview this content, I'm getting a lot of context around what it is. So I'm seeing things like who the owners are who have been involved in creating and managing this content. I can obviously what, see what it's called and the description of it. I can see how fresh the data is based on the last time it was refreshed in the particular asset. I can see any classification for the content. So, you know, is this something that is for internal use only? Does it contain sensitive information? Um, I can see glossary terms that Marius mentioned, and we'll look at these in more detail, but you know, this has been tagged with metrics that have been defined and described and that have owners behind them. I can see an image of the dashboard in terms of the last time it updated and, and what it actually means. And so even before I access this content, I've got some context around what it is, who's responsible for it, what it contains, and whether it's going to answer the question that I have right now. And if it does, then obviously I'm going to want to drill into that. And in, in the Metric Insights portal, we basically embed that report now. In this case, it's coming from Tableau, but it could be any underlying technology within this portal view. So it's very simple for the user to be able to interact with it and see the context around it. So at the top, you'll see the glossary terms that we mentioned about. You'll see the classification that we've just talked about and the ownership. Um, you'll see things like documentation that may be related to this content that was added during the publication process. So it could be things like release notes or further definitions or help around how this should be being used. So again, it's not just about sort of publishing content for users. When, when that content is governed, I get some sort of sense of confidence as an end user that what I'm looking at is correct and I'm interpreting it and using it in, in, the, in the right way. Um, another piece of the, the governance process as well, both from the sort of publication perspective and creation of content, but also can be useful for sort of the end user is this concept of a lineage as well. And understanding, you know, if I'm, if I'm either checking this report as part of the certification process or even consuming it, where did this report come from and, and where's it being used? And in this case, we can see, you know, the Tableau dashboard was coming from a particular instance of Tableau, but also that it's being pushed out in a number of distributions in the organization where people are consuming it and be able to really understand, you know, for a, for a particular asset, what are the component, components that make up that asset and, and how, how, excuse me, how, how is it being used? So we've got the context around it. Um, we've also got the context that this particular report has been certified. And we'll touch on how that happens in a minute. But it's important if we're going to publish content to, again, not only add the governance layers and context to it, but also let people know that that has been done and that it's been checked. And so the concept of, of a certification stamp of approval is important. You know, having accountability when it was certified. So as a user, again, when I come into this, I ultimately know I can trust it and it's something I can, I can be working with. So the general idea within, within any portal is to bring everything together, to give the context behind it, to have that layer of certification, to be able to organize content in one place and give users this, this catalog of content where they can come and search through it 
and understand based on that metadata what it is that's available, filtering out by things like what has been certified. So again, I, I'm focusing and easily able to find the content that I'm interested in and make sure that it's truly what's answering, answering my questions. So that's kind of the, the, the end result that we're trying to achieve with governance is, is make it um, easy for people to consume the right content based on, on what it's trying to achieve, um, what a particular report is trying to achieve. So again, I'm using the right content, but I'm understanding how, how it's being created and what it's, what it's telling me. So let's, let's transition over and talk a little bit about um, the, the publishing process behind this. So as Marius said, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So whatever technology you put in place, you need to have the ability to define a particular publishing workflow. You know, how does the content get into the portal with all that context to the point that we can certify it? And so within Metric Insights, we have this concept of, of what we call publishing workflows that can be as simple as, I'll show you some, some end examples of this, can be as simple as sort of a, a one party, as Marius mentioned before, where it's going through essentially a simple review step before it gets published to, to the, the, the end users in, in the organization or as complex as say a three-party workflow where again, um, the different steps, there's different um, constituents, different um, people responsible for reviewing and adding and checking the data and adding the context to it before it ultimately gets published. So you need a technology that will support different workflows. And if we look at what that looks like from, from an end user perspective, you know, so what does publishing content mean? Well, it's about pushing it through that workflow. So I'm gonna take the very simple example where maybe I'm doing these all, all these steps of, of review and publish. So I'm in here with a particular workflow where we've essentially got three steps. New content will come into the workflow. It will go through a sort of certification process and a, a governance process before it gets published um, in a complete fashion out to our users. So as a particular user here, John, there's a couple of um, dashboards that have come into my queue. You'll see again, they're coming from different technologies here. And I, in this simple case, may be responsible for doing some of the things that we spoke about. So assigning it to a particular category that users have access to. Um, I may then um, take that across into um, a, a stage where I'm responsible for then, um, once it's in progress in the review process, for adding in the appropriate metadata. So. I may tag it with the, the key metrics that we've spoken about and uh, that are included within this particular uh, dashboard. I may classify it. So, you know, this is for internal use, but it doesn't contain any PII data. I may attach documentation to it at this point before it gets sent out. But ultimately, again, whether it's a simple example like this, where it's just me doing it or, or multiple users, at some point, once I'm happy with that, I'm essentially going to save that and move it into a, a certified state for our um, for our users. So in this case, um, um, I can move it into our final complete state where it's going to be ultimately certified and available to our, our end users at that point. And so whether it's a, a simple process like this whether it's you know the other end of the scale that we were talking about where there's multiple stages where the developers are reviewing it the business owners are reviewing it the data stewards are looking at the data before it ultimately gets published um, we can manage these different workflows different users responsible for different pieces and ultimately again what are we trying to do here um, we're trying to if we go back to our portal end up with a set of certified content that the, the end users will have access to. So everything in one place, publishing workflows to get it out there in, in a governed way, and being able to do that in, in 
oftentimes a pretty distributed format. So, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, having one analyst in your organization to do this. There's probably multiple teams publishing content um, in, in different uh, workflow formats that we've spoken about. The third piece of the puzzle uh, for the last five minutes here that we'll talk on is, is around sort of measurement of, of the process as well. So Marius mentioned before about having, um, you know, uh, sort of the checks and balances to say, is, is the governance process um, affecting how we use data in an organization? Is it improving the way we use data? Are we getting better engagement with the BI assets that we are, um, we are putting out there for our business users? And in order to do that, one, one measurement of that is, is essentially looking at how, how content is being used. And any portal that you put in place like this needs to be able to measure um, usage at, at really any touch point within the organization. So I could be accessing reports and dashboards within the portal like we've looked at here, but equally I may be consuming it because it's gone out in a distribution to my email and that's ultimately where I'm accessing the content or I could be bookmarking it in the underlying tool or I could be accessing it on my mobile device. Anywhere a user is touching a piece of content, we wanna make sure we're tracking that and, and using it as a, as a gauge of how well our assets are being used that we're publishing. And so within Metric Insights, we, we report on that information. So obviously I can look at views of content over time, but more importantly, I can see, you know, on a rolling basis, in this case, the last 60 days, what content is actually being used, what's increasing in popularity, what's decreasing over time, what's going unused, um, and getting a view, you know, for either as a, the library of content as a whole or the content that I'm actually responsible for, the one, ones where I've actually pushed it or created it, and pushed it out through our, our workflow process, I should be able to see how that engagement is happening and down to a pretty detailed level as well. So oftentimes we'll look at usage at a very high level, you know, in this case, our Tableau sales analysis dashboard was viewed 747 times in the last 60 days, but I need to really understand the user journey with that content. Was that because I published it 60 days ago and 747 people came in to see what it was all about, but decided it was actually not that useful and never went in again? Or is it something that's get, getting continual engagement over time? And so being able to look at some sort of visualization like we're looking at here, where we're sort of simulating over that 60 days, which users or user groups were coming in and engaging with that content, are they coming in regularly, i.e. they're bouncing in and out and, and looking at it on an ongoing basis, or did they kind of look at it once like John here and, and never come back in again? And so by understanding that engagement, understanding who's looking at it, being able to better um, either promote or categorize that content so that people get better usage out of it um, is, is important. Um, Another way to think about sort of the effectiveness of governance when we're talking about the categorization content is understanding whether people are, are even finding the content. So, you know, what, one thing that categorization allows us to do, as we saw within the search, is make sure that people can actually find the things that they're looking for. And so tracking things like search performance, you know, when people enter search terms into the, into the portal, are they getting results? Are they actually clicking on content? And, and you know, it's a successful thing because they found it. Or are they searching for things where either there's no results coming back or they're, they're unsuccessful because they're not clicking on any content in those search results? And again, using that to better understand how should we categorize content or if this content isn't available, it may be candidates for things that we should be building in the future. And then the final thing for usage, you know, understanding that over time, you know, are we getting better 
um, um, engagement with BI in general across our whole body of content. If we look at sort of 30, 60, 90 day usage of content, are we seeing positive trends where that's increasing because you know, we're seeing better engagement and we're seeing uh, people finding the things that they, they really need. So again, in summary, and, and we'll open this up for questions in a second, in, in summary, you know, three things, portal, get everything in one place, make sure people consume content and that they can find it, have the necessary publishing workflows to be able to get it out there with context and then measure that and understand what effect it is having, having within the business. So I think we're, we're right on 11.45 here, Shannon. Why don't we see if there's some questions? Thank you both so much for this great presentation. Lots of questions coming in. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides recording as well as anything else requested throughout. Um, so lots of great questions coming in here. So diving in, how is a data steward for BI analytics governance different from the data steward for traditional data governance? Um, I think it's a, it's a, it, it can be a broader role. It kind of def, def, depends a little bit on how you define it, but a traditionally kind of a data steward in a, in a more just purely focused on, a, on data governance is just looking at the uh, provenance of the data itself, you know, how is it coming in, the quality of it. Um, I, I think it's important to maybe expand that stewardship role a bit more in, in, in this context to really understand, to, to have that data steward also understand, you know, what analytics are sourcing this lineage a little further upstream than just the final landing place of the data in the data warehouse, because again, it's a holistic approach. So if you take the traditional data governance role, plus add the ability to really explore and understand lineage in into the analytics where the data is consumed, right? And, and validating the quality around that entire process. In, in other words, saying not just, is, did the data in the warehouse land correctly, but do we have quality all the way into the analytic? Do we have the right dependency checks to make sure that that Tableau dashboard is pulling the data at the right time, right? All the, then, it, it, then that becomes the full on uh, stewardship role that, that that's covers uh, in the BI governance scenario. So that, that's a great question. Uh, so what components and thresholds would be set in order to fire data quality alerts if the system has a lot of content, where would we where would be an ideal starting point for a BI analyst to start in order to set appropriate alerts. Yeah, um, I, I can take this one. So, so I think this is an interesting one. So if you think of the, the typical flow, there's often sort of checks and balances happening within your sort of ETL processes. But I think this, you know, interpreting this question, I think it's important to have the checks and balances from, from a BI and analyst perspective as well. And the way we see that happening is, um, and we actually have some alerting capabilities that we didn't get to within, within the demo there, but is being able to, yes, have some alerting around some of the sort of more technical aspects of your dashboards. So oftentimes analysts will set up alerts um, in, in our customers where they're looking at things like the, the size of the data set that is, is driving a particular dashboard, you know, the number of rows that typically get loaded. And if there's an anomaly, you know, suddenly one day we get half as many rows as we usually do, then that could be an indicator of, of a data quality issue. But also setting up alerts around sort of the business metrics within the dashboard, because if you've got a sales dashboard like the one we were looking at, and suddenly there's a drop in sales significantly on a particular day, well, reality is that could be a business issue, in which case you want to be alerted to it. But by alerting the analyst to that issue first, it could also be an indication that absolutely something happened with the data. And you know, you may want to check on that before it goes out to the general population. So I'd say set up alerts that kind of yes, touch on sort of some of the technical aspects, but also use that business metric KPI alerting to uh, to use it as sort of an early warning that something might be in, might be wrong with the data, um, and if it isn't, and you check it, then alert the business users because something's going on in the business. And and I would add to what Mike said is you know if it, it, to the to the vein in the vein of where should I start, 
because you can't boil the ocean, you can't check on everything on day one. Well, use that same classification grid that we showed you, right? Look at what are those assets that you have today that fall into those, those parts of the grid where they have high business impact, high use, user volume, and then you know you work your way down to that high impact line. And that, those are the items that you wanna validate using those two mechanisms, Mike said, you know, validating for all of our role counts, things like that, but then the, the, the metric itself, if it's changed in a significant way, and notifying that. Perfect. So do you have any suggestions for tracking the impact of some of the certification process? Any rule of thumb to build this review into the process? Um, in terms of tracking the certification process? Yeah. yeah. So I think the, the key there is whatever workflow you use, uh, whatever tool or technology or capability you use, the, the key is to ensure that there is logging around that, right? And that there's reporting around the logging that takes place. So for example, if there's an expectation that something gets certified or gets through the public, moved through the published process and certified uh, in a, in a, within a, a week, and then you know, check to see the things that don't get, that haven't started the process and have not ended should get, should get escalated to somebody via notifications. Um, if there's the, uh, the same thing, if there's the expectation that you're going to recertify after a certain period of time, having that log such that you have reporting that goes out to the appropriate party to say, hey, your content that you certified six months ago is subject for recertification, go in there and then you know, hit this link and go to recertify. So making that really, really easy and transparent are, are, the, are the two key things. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that, and I'm, I'm scanning questions here, and I know we're going to run out of time. I think related to that, there's, there's sort of a lot of questions around sort of ROI and budget and, you know, your BI practices in general, you know, measuring the, the, the certification itself as well. So if you've got a body of content that you're expecting to be certified, how much is certified? Is the stuff that's certified getting better engagement because people are trusting it, or you know, compared to the stuff that isn't certified? You know, if an analyst is responsible for a body of content, how much of his or her content have they certified versus not? Um, you know, measure the process, but measure what you have as well within that library of BI content that you're managing. Yeah. What else? We There, Shannon. Sorry, I was talking to my meat button there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, uh, what I was saying is we do get a lot of questions around ROI. It is a really common question. And, and uh, um, so all too often, there seems to be low utilization, which uh, tends to cause management to become hesitant for continued budget allocation. So you want to expand on that? And to, yeah, the best practice so. sure ROI? Yeah, I can I can start with that. So you know, I think that's that's you know been the reality with uh, with BI over the last couple of decades, right? And I think in some respects it's because we've become almost a victim of our own success in terms of we've made it too difficult for people to to use content, right? Uh, it's easier for a business user who's got a couple of minutes every day to pick up the phone and ask for a set of data or some report rather than go and find it themselves because there's just thousands of reports out there that, that he may he or she may have access to. So yeah, I, I think the way to, to start is by getting your BI under control with some of the techniques that we've been talking about and it's less about volume and it's more about quality and making sure that what you're making available to business users is the stuff that they should be using and that they can easily find and stumble across that content if they need it. So that it's easier to do that than again, pick up the phone and ask for something else because reality is a lot of BI teams spend 24 seven fighting fires rather than what they've been recruited for, which is probably to do more advanced analytics and you know, move the business forward. So I would say, you know, the way to start is getting your environment under control, focusing on the body of content that's important, have a process to publish that content in a governed way, measure that it is being used and actually change the paradigm and show your management some higher engagement figures. 
uh, and you know map that back to your BI tool usage, right? You know, reality is, you know, are you utilizing the licenses that you're paying for based on the engagement that you're getting with the content? Because if you're not, maybe there's an opportunity to reallocate some of the things that you have or uh, or focus in different areas. Yeah, I think what Mike said is exactly right, and, and it reminds me of that old uh, sort of uh, Stephen Covey uh, saying that when there's no gardener, there's no garden. Right, and, and this governance process is about creating a garden. Right? It's about creating a, a, an environment that it has the, the content is curated, that, that's useful and meaningful. So you know, yes, there are all these measurements and numeric ROIs, but at the end of the day, many times if you're very, the numbers you already have, how much engagement is out there, how much duplicated content there is out there, how much content is not going unused out there. In and of themselves, themselves, you can use that to generate ROI, to just say, look, there's a, a tremendous opportunity to turn this jungle that we have here into, into a, a well-governed, well-manicured garden. And I think we have time for a few more questions here. Um, so one question is, you know, I'm having a hard time seeing how analyst governance is different from data governance, except the different topic. You know, is there something different? Is there something extra that's needed? Is there uh, for data governance for analytics? Yeah, I think that the major distinction we were trying to do, I think that the, the speaker is uh, the person who asked the question that hit on a point that there's very similar principles here. The point is that historically, if you look at most organizations, you look at the data governance functions that are happening in there, they're very narrow in scope. They're focused around, you know, the, 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 when the data gets into the data warehouse, um, then, then that's where the responsibility ends. You know, so you're basically saying, well, how, do, how does the data get in? What kind of, who do we allow this data to consume this data? Uh, what is the classification around those data? So you know, to stop at there is, is just, it's, that's all necessary, but it's insufficient from a BI governance perspective. So the way to think about BI governance, it's a broader umbrella that encompasses data governance, but also extends the principles you use in data governance to the analytics themselves, to those visualizations, to those dashboards, to the, to the spreadsheets that are created off of this data and then are consumed by the end user. And I think that's a key point as well. I think you know, oftentimes governance happens in a vacuum divorced from the users themselves. And hopefully some of the things we showed you know, show how actually governance can be helpful to the end user rather than just sort of this checks and balances thing that happens behind the scenes, right? If you're going to put this effort into, you know, check the data and categorize it and tag it and certify it, you know, expose that to the end user through through analytics governance practices so that they can they can have benefit out of that. On mute again, Shannon. So what about tools? Um, how do you add tools to the mix, tools and environments? How does that fall into analytics governance? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I can start. I think I think the challenge with um, with a lot of environments is, you know, we're, we're all reporting in many different tools and technologies, everything from Excel to, you know, reporting in our operational systems to, you know, oftentimes multiple BI tools within an organization. And I think the challenge doing that in, in that sort of environment is, you know, some of those tools may have some governance capabilities, others may not, you know, anywhere in between. And so, you know, I think it's very difficult to implement governance in a heterogeneous environment like that if you don't have some sort of layer of technology on top, you know, and obviously whether that's metric insights or something else that allows you to manage governance independent of the underlying tools where the content exists, I think is important to really be able to do it successfully. Otherwise, you just end up with governance happening in a lot of different vacuums across the organization. And then it becomes very difficult to report on that and understand how well it's, it's happening. Yeah, and I, and I think, I don't know if that's what the person was getting to in their question, but the other aspect of this is the governance of the, of the technologies. And I think there's an aspect where this enables that as well in the sense that, you know, if you're measuring utilization at a very detailed level, you can do things like, you know, look at how licenses are being used and by whom and be able to effectively, there's another area of ROI as well, effectively reallocate the license usage in such a way that you're better governing the, the usage of the tools that you have today, right? If you, 
you, it, and, and there's a number of ways, we didn't really have time to get into it, but there's a number of ways in which the portal enable, should enable that as well. Um, and then finally, the governance process, the workflow process that Mike showed you can also be integrated into a, a, a multi-environment scenario where you are saying, I'm going to move this content in my QA environment through in multiple stages. And as a final step, it's actually going to be going into production. There should be automation around the automatic synchronization of content into the workflow so that you can determine, you know, which is the, which are the things that are subject for promotion and certification, as well as on the back end, potentially, which are the things that are subject from going from QA to production. So there's lots of complexity around that can, that can be integrated in the more complex uh, enterprise environments. Well, thank you both for this great presentation and for the Q&A, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the information. We'll get you all their contact info so you can and get them the additional questions that we didn't have a chance to get to so we can get you answers to those. Um, and just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording as well as uh, the additional contact information for you all. Thanks again to Metric Insights for helping make this webinar happen. Really appreciate it, Mike and Marius. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Shannon. You, Thanks, Shannon. everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Have a great day.